Greetings and welcome to Speak Up, the television arm of Freemasonry throughout New Zealand. I am Barry Rushton, your host, where I talk to interesting people who have done interesting things but still find time to be active in Freemasonry. We have another great show for you this week. My special guest is retired Senior Sergeant Murray Morrissey from the New Zealand Police Dog Squad. I will talk to Rick Pullen, the Master of Lodge of Peace, who is involved with a Got Your Back Packs. And we will round out the show with our regular contributor, Graham Houston, looking back on the life of a famous Freemason who contributed to New Zealand or the world in general. But first up, our special guest. Murray, thank you for being our special guest today. Retired Senior Sergeant Murray Morrissey from the Police Force. Thank How you. wonderful is that? Yep. All of us have seen this television program, I think it's TV One, I'm giving you a plug, uh, The Dog Squad. Mm -hmm. How did it feel for you to actually live it? Absolutely amazing, Barry. It was just a wonderful, a wonderful life. Fast, furious and action-packed. Auckland, New Zealand. A crazed man wields a shotgun in a standoff with police. After firing a few shots to show he means business, the suspect retreats behind closed doors. He returns, toting twin shotguns and wearing an ammunition belt. Although he appears calm, in reality, this guy is a loose cannon. He's so dangerous, he accidentally fires one of his own weapons. Police aren't taking any chances as they surround the area. With the stakes growing by the minute, a canine named Luke charges the gunman and is fired on immediately. When two more dogs are sent to his aid, the suspect is forced back inside, allowing the wounded dog to return to his handler. With the standoff far from over, police reposition themselves. This time, another canine catches the suspect off guard. The takedown is complete. Once again, a potentially deadly situation is avoided thanks to a police dog. As for Luke, after a lengthy recovery, he was given a clean bill of health and a silver medal for his exceptional bravery in the line of duty. A good police dog makes the job look easy. It was just one of those jobs that um, some people ha are fortunate enough to have. It was like going to work to play. <laughs> and it was full of adventure. May I say that, having said that, there, were, there, were, there are other aspects of it that were um, sometimes quite disturbing, the emotional part and the, th the sights that you saw and uh, things like that, but uh, by and large you learn to cope with that as, 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 as you went on in life. Exactly. Well, see, we see it and we see the, the door cage open, the dog leap out and, and he's tugging at the, at the, at the chain and, the, and the, the big burly policeman grabs him and chucks him over the fence and leaps over there. Now, you would have done a bit of that yourself, I'm sure. Very much so, yes. <laughs> yes. yes, I loved it, as a matter of fact, but, um, you know, that's, it's a young man's game and you can't do that forever. So you have a limited, uh, limited time when you're out doing that. It was way back in around about 1956 that I think that the actual police dogs were actually introduced, or police dog was actually introduced into New Zealand, uh, based on a visit to England by, I believe, Sid Holland, the, pri the, the Prime Minister at the time. That's right. And so a, a, a long trip happened and, a, and out comes this police dog and a police handler. And so that's when it started in New Zealand. Now, that was in 56. Now, mm -hmm. you were at 56, you were just still not long out of your, out of your diapers and short, short pants. Correct. So when did you actually join the police force? When did you start yourself and why did you start? Well, I joined in 1965, okay. looking for a new, I suppose, looking for adventure or whatever sort of thing. So uh, I joined in, in, in a place called the infamous Ruatoria. <laughs> <laughs> True. <laughs> yes, I did. Well. And uh, from there, I, was, I, I was, uh, went to the, the training school, which was at um, Trentham at the time. Yep. Pretty primitive conditions, may I say, but of course we didn't know any better. And uh, my first posting was Wellington, um, where I'd gone to high school. And from there, um, it's, from then on, it really was the, the rest is history. I, I, I had a great career, wonderful career. So before you joined the actual, uh, the do I'll call it the dog squad. I, hate, I, yeah, I, yeah, I, I hope fine. I'm not treading on your toes. No, right, no, no. Before that, you were, you were a, a bobby. You were a police person. Yeah, sure, sure, in I was. Yeah, various well, locations. Walk promoted. the beat, uh, walk the beat in Lambton Key in Wellington, and True. walk the beat in Queen Street. And uh, I was actually stationed at Takapuna on the North Shore at the time that I was accepted oh. into the dog section. Yes. Okay. And yeah. so when was that? When? When? Did, why again did you decide? Let's go into the dog, the dog section. I'd quite like to do that. Right. That was about late 1969, I think. I don't tell people that it's you know, so <laughs> long. You know, so think, you know, yes, but uh, I had a friend that joined the dog section. And, um, in fact, he's still around now and he's still a good friend. And he said, Murray, if you want action and excitement, this is the job for you. And it proved to be. 
more than I ever expected. Expected, right. The adventure and the places that it took me and the people I met, it was a wonderful career. I also believe back in those times, you know, it may be just myth or a story, but there were some politicians and some people, I think, in the police who actually didn't really want the police dog unit to survive. And they, or, or to be part of the of the system, and apparently they set up a test. If I, correct me if I'm wrong. Where they got someone to go and hide, and they gave the dog, a, a, okay, go and find this one. Mm -hmm. And you've got to find it by a certain time. If you don't find it by a certain time, then we're going to can the whole project. Is, 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 was that a story, or was well, that? Well, I heard I heard that from the from the horse's mouth himself. The, the, wow. the, the, the handler that was engaged to uh, yeah. tasked to do it, and that is a true story. But of course, there were a lot of. They had to combat a lot of prejudice when they joined, when they yeah, when they yeah. started because yeah. they'd got these old these old policemen retired at seventy. They didn't need dogs to do anything. Yeah. You know this new weapon that came out from yeah. England and uh, and so there, there there was there was a lot of uh, as I say a lot yeah. of prejudice and they they struggled in those early years to get established. Mm. And I have to take my hat off to those early pioneers, mm. the guys that set it up for us. Exactly. And um, and they did a wonderful job. They wonderful did. job. You see, when you see a police dog, you know, un under a sort of a general situation, it's always usually, generally a big Alsatian, Correct. and the handlers are usually a big bloke as well. Mm -hmm. But, you know, if you come through the airport, you know, they have these other little beagles, these other little ones, you know, poking around. Mm -hmm. It never ceases to amaze me. And does it, you also too, the stupidity of some people who actually tick on a form that they've got no food, but the dog comes along, plonks itself down next to them and finds a half-eaten apple or, or a plate of processed meat. I mean, does it stagger you? It, it does really. They they must th think the law enforcement or the border patrol in, uh, in New Zealand are stupid. Don't forget. You know, look the message they get there. Look, if you if you offend, we'll catch you. Mm -hmm. And and we see that. And um, they do a great job. All the, all those law enforcement dogs, the drug dogs, the, the explosive dogs, the firearms dogs. They've got dogs now that find money. Exactly. Exactly. And they're a great job. And so, I'm assuming then is that's because the training takes advantage of the, the increased ability of a dog's scent, right? They just train them to find that particular thing. We, we they, not me, we now. Yeah. Uh, it, it's the dog's sense of smell is which they capitalise yeah. on. A dog has got a wonderful sense of smell. And of course we just utilise that. Yeah. And to channel it in, into a game, it's everything is a game for the dog, of course. It's all a game. And of course when a dog is happy, he works for you. It's very simple as that. And if New Zealand money and Australian money smells different? Well, <laughs> <laughs> it, could, it could well be. <laughs> it could well be, yeah. In your time as being, uh, I'll say a dog handler, if that's mm, fair that's enough. Right, that's correct, yeah. You must have gone through a, a number of, um, of exciting, I won't say chases, but exciting events. Uh, is there, I'm sure there's more than one, but is there anything that, without divulging confidences, is there anything that you could sort of tell us about sort of a little, you know, little journey you went on with your dog at one stage? Little incident? Little well, incident, well, yeah, that's the word. yeah, incident. Well, of course there were many. And sort of one leads into the other, and of course, people used to say to me, "Now, Murray, um, when you finish, you have to write a book about this. You see, all your experiences, and bring all the information yeah. from the from the chaps all around, the, all those wonderful guys that are out there working, uh, and women, I should say, as well, and put it all down on paper. But sort of one story almost like leads into the next, and, and the, they follow a similar pattern. But as as a young guy, you know, adventure, you know, and excitement. Yeah. We uh, we went up north once uh, to hunt a murderer who had escaped from the prison in Auckland here. Uh, and um, we took 10 days to catch him. And that was an amazing adventure. Um, and to this day, I, I, I see my colleagues, uh, my former colleagues, and we always talk about that. You know, and you make friendships yeah. that, 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 that stay with you for life. So it was in the valleys, in the bushes and things like that? Absolutely. On the track, beaches? Yeah. Up around Kawakawa way there. Yeah. And, um, Up and down creeks and things like yeah, that, trying to yeah. lose the sea. In the middle of the night, trying to find somewhere to sleep. I've watched a lot of television, Murray. I sort mm. of know how criminals would sort of get away or try and get away. <laughs> yes, I try. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Mary, you said that you know someone, a friend of yours, said to you that uh, if you want excitement and you know blah blah blah, the police dog unit is for was for you. So, what kind of a person actually wants to get into being a police handler, a, a dog handler? Well, I would say that um, I guess they come by a favourable impression of us, and um, that's an interesting comment. Mm -hmm. And uh, they see what what the handlers do, and and, and they say, look, I want to do that. I want to be like these guys, and they come to you and. Um, you know, if they're lucky enough, they get accepted. But let me tell you, Barry, the Auckland Police Dog Section is the hardest section in the New Zealand Police to get into. Wow. Yeah? And I didn't make that up. Somebody told me that. Okay. And I thought, <laughs> I went out to lunch on that for years. But no, we're, the, we're very careful how we select them. You know, for example, when I was in the position of selecting, 
I'd, wa I'd watch a guy for a year before I decided he was the man. Build a dossier up on him to get the right man. So you've got to have a, the right man with that group of people. You get, you, get, you get the wrong person in a group of 10 or 12, you know, you can cause huge disruption. So you've got to be very careful who you pick. And I'd like to think that we get it pretty right most of the time. Now, they're doing a great job, those men and women out there, Barry. They're doing a wonderful job in the streets of Auckland making the streets safer for decent law-abiding citizens. Correct. And uh, I'm very proud of them, and I am their number one fan for after all this day. Murray, before you go, I always like to ask our guests, you know, I know you've been in Freemasonry now for, uh, I won't say some time, but I think you joined in about 1975, if I, uh, I remember rightly, or you initiated then, mm. and became a Master Mason, I think, in 76. So by that stage, you were still quite young. I mean, mm -hmm. well, mm. you're still quite young, of course, oh. even now. What can I say? But, um, <laughs> so what made you, what led you into Freemasonry? Was it, was it part of uh, your colleagues in the police? Was it someone outside? Was it just a general interest in what you thought it might be about? Not really. It's quite comical, really, may I say. I, should, uh, I had a friend uh, that I got to know, and um, he just broached it with me one night. He broached it with me one night. Yeah. He, you, know, you should join this. Showed, him, uh, showed me the blue book. And he said, you should join this, Murray. And I said, oh, is that right? Okay. And I didn't <laughs> think much more of it. And I mentioned it to my father-in-law, who had been in Freemasonry. And he said, Murray, if you join, I'll buy you a suit. And I thought, Anything for a suit. Anything for a suit. <laughs> and everyone wouldn't like that. Of course, the poor lovely chappy died before that happened. But from there I went. And then, of course, once you started the process of, uh, of, uh, of um, joining, you realised that there are other people that you knew were in it. Yeah, and yeah. all of a sudden, they were encouraging you to do so. And I thought, well, if these guys are in it, these, these people are in it, yeah. sorry, not guys, these people are in it, it's good enough for them, it's good enough for me. And they were really fine, upstanding uh, citizens. Yeah, yeah. And I thought, well, if, it, if it's good enough for them, it's good enough for me. Terrific. So you've had a distinguished career in the police force and you are enjoying a distinguished career, uh, I say career, a, a situation within Freemasonry. Mm. So you've had long enough to actually allow the, the, the thinking about what the values and what the meaning of Freemasonry is. There's something sticks in your mind of, gee, I'm glad I joined Freemason because. Well, there are many things, Barry, what, uh, what, what Freemasonry does for you. Yeah. I suppose you could say, well, what do, what do I do for Freemasonry, I suppose? Um, but um, yeah, it teaches you a lot of things, and it, and, and it, it just evolves what, what it teaches you. You know, you, you, you can't really sort of plot it down in your, as life goes on. It, it, uh, you look back and say, now what has it done for me? Well, of course, it's made me a better person than I was, you know. When I was running around with that police dog, and you know, I had, I was lucky, I had an exceptional police dog. Wow. And maybe there's some people watching this program going to say, what a big noter. <laughs> but, but, but no, no, he was an exceptional dog, and uh, I, I used to sort of walk around like a cockroach, think I was, you know, I was uh, Mr. Superman, you know, sort of thing. Free Mason, he brought me down to earth and said, "Now hold on a minute, Sonny, you know, wow. it's 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 not like that." And um, many things, gr the values, the benevolence, the camaraderie, and I enjoy that. I enjoy the ceremony, you know, and so forth. Yeah. It doesn't suit everybody, you know. Some people have different things that suit them in Freemasonry, but those are all things that suit me, and. Um, they, they sit with me very well. When you lost the dog, when you lost your dog, obviously the dog mm. dies. Did you get another one after that, or was that the end of your career in Freemason in, um, in the police force then? No, no. What what happens? The, the process, and it doesn't always work this way, but it's planned to try and work this way. When you, when your dog is is starting to show his age, yep. and that's around about eight years old, you know they haven't got a long career. You know, five okay. or six years when you're getting the best out of your dog. Yep. Um, then you think you think ahead. Okay, now do I want to stay? Uh, then you then you look for a replacement. Another one. And the idea is you get a pup, young yeah. pup, from our train our magnificent training centre in Wellington, and you, and you bring it through. And by the time the old fellow's ready to call it a day, this, one's this fellow's ready. Well, not necessarily ready to go, but he's half trained anyway. Yeah, yeah. Now that's the perfect scenario. It doesn't always work that way, right. but um, that's that, that's how it mostly works. And so, did you do that? Yes, yes, I did. Um, I was lucky. Yeah, well, I have, yeah, yeah, I had a couple of failures before that, <laughs> but, unfortunately, <laughs> but uh, they didn't get very far. But yeah. I finally got the one that I that I wanted, right. and he worked. And um, of course, we had him up and trained in eight weeks. Wow. That was exceptional, really. Not me, but the people that were training me. You know, right. he, and he was a dog that f he fitted the mould. He was meant to be a police dog. dog yeah. You know, and uh, he was easy to train. Please, dog uh, German shepherds are easy to train. 
They're a great dog. Be because uh, great yeah, they're born to be police dogs. They smell, though, Murray. No, no, they don't. No, they do, if, you, they if, do. You, if you wash them every week, it's no true? problem. Oh, I know you see? everyone I've heard. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> sort of thing. <laughs> Murray, thank you for being a great guest. Thank you. I could talk more about the police dog, but it's just great having We're out of time today. But thanks for being a guest today. I really appreciate it. Okay. Thank, thank you. you very much, Barry. Coming up is our next guest, Rick Pollock. Greetings, Rick. Welcome to the show. Nice to see you. Hi, Barry. Thanks for having me. Great. Now, Lodge of Peace, it's a very interesting title in the first place. Tell me a little bit more how Lodge of Peace got its name. Okay, so the Lodge of Peace was formed at the end of the Second World War. So the, the name lends itself. Yeah, um, it, it's a time of peace. And uh, it was formed by a group of businessmen, uh, lawyers and accountants here in downtown Auckland. And, um, yeah, it's had back then about 40-odd members, and it's stayed about that same size ever since. Yeah. Yeah. It seems like a great little lodge. You meet in the actual, the largest lodge room here in Auckland, which is in 181 Kyber Pass Road. And I know that every lodge has a special feel about them, and it seems like your lodge is a very friendly sort of atmosphere, not only in the ritual and not only in the actual meetings you have, but outside of the lodge rooms. I mean, that would be a fair comment, wouldn't it? Oh, it is. It's a, it is a fair comment. We, um, it's something we work on. So we have uh, a nice balance between what we do in the lodge room yep. and uh, then socially we like to get together. Um, so we'll come out to my place, we'll live out in the country, we'll do a nice barbecue and do a bit of clay bird shooting. Um, last year we all went fishing together and um, didn't catch many fish but we raised a lot of money for charity through that. Great. And um, this year we're going to fish again and um, we'll have a special dinner for all the guys who are or have been masters of the lodge. We'll get together for a really nice dinner with our wives. And uh, the younger guys, we're doing yum char in a couple of weeks. So Great. Yeah, it's very social. Fantastic. The name, as you, said, as you led up to at the beginning, the Lodge of Peace, it has that ring about it. Now, every lodge has members from different walks of life. But I think your lodge has had a couple of members that really fall under that umbrella of peace. Uh, I'm talking mainly about the, uh, the, the men of the cloth that you've had as members of the lodge. Tell me a bit about those two. Sure. So we've had two really special brothers in our lodge. Um, the, the most recent that we should probably talk about is, is uh, Reverend John Reimer, who was the, the Anglican Dean of Auckland. And he had a lot to do outside of lodge with the, um, the Holy Trinity Cathedral. Yes, he did. And um, John was a wonderfully forthright, outspoken man, so he always... Uh, told you what he thought, and um, he was a, a he was a master of our lodge actually back in the 90s, yeah. and a really uh, much loved master, and um, yeah, contributed a lot to the discussion about um, the place of Freemasonry for people who who are of faith and attend churches. Excellent, because it's well known, I think, or may not be well known, that amongst to be Freemasonry there is no topic of religion or politics but you actually do have to have faith, a faith, to be a part of a Freemason. That's right, that's right. You have to have a supreme being who, who you've acknowledged. And um, uh, sort of complementing John's role in our lodge further back in the 40s, probably about our third master actually, was um, Reverend uh, Everell Orr, Great. who was uh, a Methodist minister. He had a lot to do with the, um, the Methodist mission up in Upper Queen Street. And um, yeah, he, um, he led by example more than anything, so it didn't have to have the discussion. It was more what he did and how he did it. Great. Sort of debunks that sort of whole mysticism that, you know, Freemasonry and religion are sort of like this. Where, now, I know it, it might be sort of bent towards the Catholicism over the years, but most of that's all gone. I mean, with, with understanding comes appreciation for sure, right? Oh, it is. It is. And, and John Reimer wrote and published many papers on that. Yeah. Yeah, he had a very frank discourse about it. And um, by the time he... He sort of um, came out of the chair and, and moved on. He pointed out that only about four or five percent of the population were attending church, and um, mm. and so he made the point, you know, that um, there isn't a lot in the argument. So mm, um, sure, yeah. Now, Rick, I know that your lodge, amongst many other things, is, is very active in the benevolence scenario through Auckland. Mm. And I believe you are a major, major supporter for a program called "I've Got Your Back." Pack, right, which supports Women's Refuge. Is that correct? That's right. Tell us more about that. So um, there's a young lady uh, over in the North Shore. Uh, her name is Anita Hinton. And uh, her mum actually approached me and said that Anita was, um, had registered a charity where she, she had uh, got herself into a situation where she needed to 
uh, go into a woman's refuge. And um, when she was there, the experience was not good. Mm. She, she was bereft of everything that she needed for her and her little daughter. And uh, much later on in her life, when she was you know, on her feet again, she determined that she was going to provide for other women who ended up in the refuge as well. So she did that. And uh, her mum asked if um, we might be in a position to help. And I took it to the lodge, and the guys in the lodge were right into it. They uh, absolutely wanted to help, so they um, all contributed. And um, by the time we gave Anita some funds, she had already distributed about $93,000 worth of bags to women's refuges. Um, and these bags contained everything that a woman or a little kid might need. Immediately, right? Immediately, Immediately yeah. Right. And when they've got to leave home and yeah. go to the refuge quickly. And we thought she was just amazing. So the guys got right behind her. Uh, we went to some of the other lodges in the district and um, yeah, we, we had some contributions from the other lodges and um, were able to give her quite a decent sum of money. And um, sure. from that, we've developed an ongoing relationship with her. So this year, we'll be looking to raise some more money, um, go out to the district and ask the other lodges if they'll contribute. And um, I think we'll probably be able to help her again. Great. You know, it is a bit of a sad indictment that actually it's needed, but it is needed. And I know the figures are not are not flash when we come to hear about abuse, uh, family abuse at homes, and people are plucked immediately from their environment and have to be taken, you know, two o'clock in the morning, you know, one o'clock in the morning, whenever. And so, as as you say, they leave with absolutely nothing. Oh, they do. And um, Anita pointed out that we were the first men's organisation to recognise her and um, the first men's organisation that had actually taken steps to help her. And, right. and for her, that was really significant because of exactly what you're talking about. Good on you, mate. Well, I wish you and the Lodge much success in doing that and continuing with that. If anybody would like to know a little bit about the Lodge of Peace, and I'm sure that they could contact the, you or contact through the Grand Lodge, uh, Lodge of Peace, and I'm sure that you'd welcome people you know, asking about whether they could even contribute to that cause would be great, even if they didn't want to be part of the Lodge. Oh, that'd be very welcome. Great. Welcome. Thank you for coming, my friend. Pleasure. It's been great to see you. Thank you. Thank you. Coming up next is our regular contributor, Graham Houston. Graham Houston. Hello, Graham. Hello, Barry. Now, I know you've got someone from New Zealand that you'd want to speak about today, right? He's a, a Kiwi bloke, right? Yes. He was also a Prime Minister, ex-Prime yes. Minister, and he was also the Grand Master. Yes. Who are we talking about? We're talking about Sir Keith Jacker Sir Keith Holyoke. Keith Holyoke, yes. Prime Minister of New Zealand for four successive terms from 1960 to 1972. Still a record. Before he, even before he became Prime Minister, he was the first officially designated Deputy Prime Minister of New Zealand. We never used to have one of That's those right. designated there. Now, Keith Holyoke was a consensus sort of a leader. He avoided dissension, which was very much unlike his successor, Rob Muldoon, <laughs> who seemed to thrive on it. At that stage. Quite so. And so he stood for Parliament in, from Motuaka, first time with the Reform Party, got into Parliament, but then lost his seat. Now, an interesting factor at the time, because he made such an impression, was Michael Joseph Savage was alleged to have said at the time, Holyoke was a good lad. Uh, he'll get back into Parliament one day, and he'll lead his party, and after they've learnt from us, they will be a better party, which oh. was a sort of a bit of a backhand compliment to, so. to Keith Holyoke so. at that stage. Uh, he wasn't in Parliament, but the party wanted him. And when the retirement of the MP Ransom from Paihiatua was uh, announced, they nominated him for the Paihiatua seat. So he gained that election, he gained that nomination, sold the orchard in Motuaka and moved to into the Paihiatua electorate and bought a cattle and sheep farm. And the wire and era. Yeah, yeah, and from then on, he continued to represent. Did Paihitua. he join a lodge in that town, do you remember? No, where he joined the lodge was in Motuaka, at number 117, a Motuaka Lodge, and that was, in, um, that was in September 1931. And he remained with that lodge until, I think it was about 1948, when he then joined Lodge Rafiti in Danivert, which is in the Eastland yeah, Rohini yeah, uh, yeah. district area, and he remained in that lodge at that, for that particular time. He was a well-loved Prime Minister, wasn't he? I mean, he really was. He was a good, he was a Kiwi bloke. I mean, he was called Kiwi Keith, wasn't he? Yeah, he was called Kiwi Keith. And that came about because of another boy in his class at school 
also called Keith Holly O'Donnell. Now, it's often reported that they were cousins. The boy, the other boy, Keith Holly Oak, was an Australian, and our Keith Holly Oak was called Kiwi to differentiate the yeah. two, but there were no uh, relation actually at all, and that name stuck with him forever. Incredible to have two names the same mm. in a class that at that time, of, you know. In a small place. In a small place, place. exactly, exactly. And, and so it was good, so that name stayed with him for a long time. As you said, he was a, he came from humble beginnings. Yes, he See, his formal education finished when he was 12, and. His mother well, homeschooled him, right? She did. I believe so. Yes, yeah, she did. And I believe he felt that quite uh, a lot through throughout his career that his formal education didn't go any further. But it meant that he never forgot those. He yeah, was yeah, very yeah, involved yeah. with agricultural uh, industry, agricultural association, agriculture union, because he was a farmer. He was a man from the land, and he was responsible for uh, or part of the council that set up uh, in London in 1946 the International Federation of. Uh, agriculture producers. He was instrumental with the council that set up the Federated Farmers in New Zealand. So he was really was a man of the land. I wonder if it's, it was his time in England where he got that sort of, that plummy sort of thing. He did have a bit of a plum in his voice. He, he certainly I mean, did. It sort of sounded like it, didn't it? And that was almost a contradiction from those humble backgrounds yeah. and the man of the common people sort of touch. But I understand from talking with different relations that his brother told him after he lost the seat back in Mochawaka there that, Keith, if you want to go further in oh. Parliament, you need a deeper voice. Oh, and he, wow. did have a, he did develop a deep voice. And apparently he used to practice for hours speaking with a deeper voice. <laughs> but I don't know whether as a result of doing that the sort of plumminess came with it or whether he actually pra practiced that as well. So he... Had that throughout throughout the rest of his career. I don't think a lot of New Zealanders know also too that he was I think the only living New Zealander that got the Order of the Garter, right? That was where it, he was the only first. had the Queen, mm. Prince of Wales, and twenty four other mm. living people, and he was one of them. At the he time. was one of those. Yeah, always insisted that his phone number was listed with everybody else's in the phone directory. Yep. He only lived a few hundred yards away from the from Parliament. And it is reported, and I think it was in uh, one of the auto biographies of him, that he was once contacted by a person who said that they had lost their luggage at the Wellington Railway Station. Now he left home and went down and helped them look for Which the luggage. Which is incredible. It's incredible. It? For a, the good Prime Kiwi a good Kiwi bloke. When was he Grandmaster? Can you remember? 1979. He was the uh, Grand Patron and the past Grandmaster in 1979. Then Rob Muldoon appointed him Governor General. Now, that was the first time oh, that a person in Parliament was being appointed as the Governor General. It was against the convention. It raised eyebrows here. It raised eyebrows, I believe, in the UK as well, because when it was announced, he left Parliament, took up the role, but it was only a three-year term, not a five-year term. So the term to expire was coincided with the election coming up then. So he served in that capacity. So he got a doctorate degrees, a water term from Victoria and Seoul University, knighthoods, and he was just a New Zealander starting from humble beginning, <laughs> making good great. and doing good. What a great choice for tonight, mate. Thank you. Keith Thank Holyoke, you. a great bloke. A very See good you next segment. week with another great New Zealander, I hope. Okay? Thank you, Thank you, Graham. Well, that's our show for tonight. Thank you for tuning in. A thank you to our special guest this evening. If you'd like to know more about Freemasonry, then feel free to go to the Grand Lodge website, which is freemasonsnz.org, or call the telephone number in Wellington on the screen. They'll be glad to help. So until I see you again, have a great week.